Good morning and welcome to Gate Ministries Durban Central Sunday Worship Service. A warm welcome to all the sons of Gate DC and a special welcome to all our viewers joining us for the first time. We are so glad to have you join us and trust that you will be blessed by today's teaching. Please feel free to like and share today's teaching on our Gate Ministries Durban Central Facebook page and YouTube channel. Greet us, tell us where you're viewing from and participate in the live chat in the comment section below. We would like to wish the following people who celebrated their birthdays in the week a very happy birthday. Annabelle, Eli, Charis, Andre, Anika and Kirtana. A very happy wedding anniversary to Mark and Cindy. We trust that you all had a wonderful day and pray that you will continue to grow in the image of God. The announcements for the week are as follows. On Tuesday, the 10th of August from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. is POA with Pastor Thamo Naidu. Please register for this meeting via the link below. The guest speaker will be Dr. Segi Gavinder. On Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. is our Zoom House Church meeting. The focus of the discussion of this meeting will be today's teaching on the Holy Spirit by Pastor Randolph Barnwell. Please rehearse this teaching as you briefly share your input during the discussion in your house church. On Friday evening at 7 p.m. is our Zoom youth meeting. All youth between the ages of 13 to 20 are welcome to join this word-filled meeting around interesting discussions. On Saturday morning is our usual Zoom prayer meeting. This will take place from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. We encourage you all to join this meeting as we seek the Lord corporately. On Saturday afternoon at 5 p.m. is our ladies meeting with Mama Renee. The topic is strengthen the things that remain. Please invite a friend to this time of empowerment and impartation. Our regular Sunday service will take place next Sunday at 9 a.m. We will be joined by a guest speaker, Dr. Rani Samuel, a clinical psychologist. Please invite a friend to this meeting. We are now going to enjoy a time of worship. Please sing along in your homes as we worship our Lord together. As a further expression of your worship, we encourage you to remain faithful in your tithes, first fruit and offering. The church banking details are displayed on your screen. If you are viewing but are a part of another church, please tithe to your church. You may give a free will offering should you desire to. Pastor Randolph Barnwell will share the word of the Lord with us. Please make sure that you have your communion emblems ready as we will partake of the table of the Lord together. Let's open our hearts and minds to receive the word of the Lord. God bless you and enjoy.
Good morning and welcome to Gate Ministries Durban Central. I am Randolph Barnwell, the Senior Elder of the Ministry. It's my joy and privilege to welcome you all to our broadcast service this morning. And I want to invite you to open up your heart and your mind to receive grace that will be accessed through your active and intelligent listening to the word of the Lord this morning. We have been dealing with our subject, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and we have come through a few sessions up to this point, and we have explored several principles to date, which I de think depict God's heart for all of His sons to be immersed baptized into the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the executor of the kingdom of God. He is the person whom Jesus said must come so that Jesus could go back to his Father. In his functionality and operation on the earth presently, he represents the entirety of of deity in his engagements, specifically in his empowerment of the sons of God to accurately represent God to the world and more importantly to fulfill the functions or the purposes of the Lord in the earth today. For today's session, I want to focus on the restorative work of the Spirit's presence within environments, specifically within economic environments. Um, as you study the Bible in reference to the Spirit's effect and impact within jurisdictions, you will come very fast to this conclusion that the Spirit is meant to have a profound impact upon geographical settings, upon environmental conditions, both corporately in terms of a sphere, but also privately in terms of a person. So I want to look at this specific issue for our focus this morning. Now, just to start off, there is something that we need to note in reference to the presence of God, that God's presence could manifest differently in varying degrees um, within our lives. Now, the first level of God's presence is the fact that He's omnipresent. God is literally everywhere. There's no place in the entire creative order where God is not. He is everywhere. In the book of Proverbs 15 verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Uh, David said at one time, where can I go from your presence? In Psalm 139. Even if I make my bed in hell, he said, God, you are there. The second level of God's presence is that God indwells all sons of God. So while God is everywhere externally, he is with His sons in a very, very profound and unique way. And here we speak of the indwelling presence of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. In Romans 8, verse 9 and 10, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So all these references indicate to us that God by His Spirit 
indwells sons of God. So the first level is everywhere, but he's not with all people in the same way. With his sons, he indwells them by the presence of the Holy Spirit within them. The third effect is what is called the manifest or tangible presence of God. This is where God, who is omnipresent everywhere, who is also uniquely in each son, at times and on specific occasions, for very definite purposes, will manifest his presence externally in a very real, demonstrable and tangible way. And we call that the manifest presence of God. For example, in James 4, 8, it says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. So yet God promised if we draw near to Him, He will come near or draw near to us. And I believe make His, pre His presence and His proximity very obvious and known to us. In, for example, in Matthew 18, 20, it says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So while God is omnipresent everywhere, secondly, with each unique Son of God in a peculiar way, indwelling them by His Spirit, He can also, where two or three of those individuals come together, he says, I am not just omnipresent, not just in you all, but will be in the midst. So in the midst of you indicates that you will have a sense of his being or his presence within your gathering. Now, gathering in his name is something very unique and particular in its meaning. I won't have time to uh, explore that here. But not just because we gathered will God be there. Our gathering must be depictive of His name, of His nature, of His character, of His purpose, and in line with His power and His authority. Now, in the book of Joel, and our local church has been reading the book of Joel in the past few weeks, here we discover some of the overt, very powerful uh, effects of the manifest presence of God. The context of the book is that the people of God have gone away from the standards and the ways of God. There's whole scale departure away from biblical principle. And there's a seeming unrepentance in the nation. To deal judgmentally with these people, God said, I will raise up an army, a heathen nation, foreign nation, to invade you. And they will ransack and lay waste your land, your economy, literally. And then, like I said last week, in the promise of God is this, that if the nation repents and turns from doing things their way with fasting, Three times the nation in the book is called too fast. God promised a, res a restoration of the land. God promised simultaneously with this restoration will come an outpouring of His Spirit. Now every time the Holy Ghost is poured out, I believe you can expect to see manifestations of His presence. Yes, He will come within you. Yes, He will come fill you and flow out from you. But I also believe that when we wait upon the Lord for incidences, when we anticipate that His Spirit will be poured out on us and over us and be made visibly manifest in our gatherings, that we can expect the manifest presence of God. And this, in this culture, in this context, God will do very, very unique and specific things. In the context of Joel's book, when the nation turned their back on God and went away from God, and God raises up this foreign judgmental nation to deal harshly with the people of God, the effects are devastating. And I won't have time to read some of those effects. I will encourage you to again reread 
the book of Joel, to discover how that sometimes when we continue upon a path of stubborn rebellion, that one of the quickest ways God uses to get our attention is to dry up our financial provision. It's amazingly, when money stops, hearts get turned to the Lord. And sometimes hearts get turned to the Lord because then people realize that without God being central in my life, I cannot exist. And God sometimes has to stop provision so that hearts get turned to Him. But in hearts turning to Him, hearts must not turn to Him because of provision issues, but because of the need for God relationally Himself. Provision is simply a byproduct of His presence. So in the book of Joel, for example, in Joel 1.4, you have this effect of devastation upon a nation disobedient. God says He will send an army that is metaphorically symbolized by a swarm of locusts whose face is like the face of horses. And if you read Joel 1.4, it says, What the knowing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. So God describes this invasion metaphorically depicted by the consuming destructive nature of the insect, the locust, in four distinct stages. He references, you will see on your screen, the gnawing locust, the swarming locust, the creeping locust, and the stripping locust. You can see other synonyms given by other versions of the Bible on your screen, as for example from the Revised Standard Version, the cutting locust, the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the destroying locust, and from the New King James, the chewing locust, the swarming locust, the crawling locust, and the consuming locust. Most of you are familiar with the King James framing of palmer worm, locust, cat, canker worm, and the caterpillar. Some theologians believe that these descriptors describe the various stages of development of the locust. So what's going to hit the nation, what's going to hit God's people, is this eroding because by, by nature, the locust in its various stages of development is a very corrosive, gnawing, eating, erosive kind of insect that simply consumes and devours everything within its path. So God said, this will be the effect. Now this speaks of crisis. And right now the world is in crisis. South Africa, and in terms of our nation, is dealing with multiple crises simultaneously. This is a day of crisis. This is a day of calamity. This is what the scripture calls in the book of Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. It shall come about in the last days that perilous times shall come. The times are perilous. People are in peril in the times. The church too will have to go through these moments. God uses these crises moments at times to turn people's hearts towards Himself. In particular, the hearts of His own people that violate His own laws. He wants to get them back to accuracy, get them back to righteousness. So what we are going to see in the next few months and years is three things. Number one, there will be a greater regularity of crisis. Regularity, it will become regular. In fact, the gap between crises will shorten. So you will just about be recovering from one and have to deal with the next one um, almost immediately. So I want to encourage you, learn to shorten your setback recovery time. Learn how to navigate during or what's going to be a characteristic feature of the modern world for the next few months and years, crises, epochs, crises, moments. 
The second thing that you need to know is that the intensity of crises will deepen. As we move along, it's going to become more severe and more intense, simply because God is very, very serious about judging the world for its error and judging the, the church itself for its departure away from standards that he has very clearly indicated to us in his word. So while on the one level they will be more regular, secondly, they will be more intense. And thirdly, the nature of the crisis will be multifaceted, variegated, multidimensional. In other words, you'll be living in a particular epoch or season in time and having to deal with various crises of different natures, different expressions, but dealing with them all simultaneously. Because God is very, very serious about um, getting His church back to biblical order, getting His church back to righteousness. So in the book of Joel, you'll have these four kinds of locusts depictive of various stages of development, having this erosive, corroding effect. And this effect, in, in particular, will happen upon the economy of the land. Because God needs to dry up economies so that people can turn to Him spiritually. Now, part of the promise of God in the book of Joel, while the book uh, in the first reading and part of it is very, very dark and gloomy, from chapter 2 onwards and into chapter 3, there's promises of great hope and great restoration if the people of God return and repent and turn to the Lord. Within the context of this turning is the promise that we read in reference to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that Peter quoted in the book of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants I will pour out of my spirit in those days. Now simultaneously promised and accompanying this outpouring is a host of promises relative to economic restoration. An economic buoyancy or ascendancy was lost because of the invasion of the foreign nation of God's people. Now, simultaneously promised with the outpouring is this economic restoration. And I want to read this to you. It's important that you get a graphic picture of what God is going to restore. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 14, who knows whether he will not turn and relent and notice, leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and even a drink offering for the Lord your God. For those of you that read the book in chapter 1, the grain and drink offering, those two expressions dried up because there was nothing to offer because of the pillage and, and, the, and the destruction of the agriculture. Now God promises, I will restore both your capacity to offer and to give and to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. I will restore both dimensions to you. And I like the phrase, God says, I'm going to leave a blessing behind me. I'm going to leave a blessing behind me. Um, I believe this imagery in part is captured in reapers on fields. When farmers, farmers harvested their fields, the reapers were told to deliberately leave particular um, portions of the harvest for the widow, the alien, and the, and the orphan. Might I remind you here in the book of Ruth, when Boaz saw Ruth gleaning on his field, his instructions to his reapers were to leave more, to leave much more than they would ordinarily do, to leave produce behind them on the field so that Ruth could glean. And this is the prophetic picture I get for everyone listening today. God is leaving blessings behind him. And I want you to pick those blessings up. You've got to be positioned. You've got to be aligned. You've got to be aware of the hour in which we live. 
might I just say before continuing, this message is largely prophetic. It's a move away from my normal methodology of teaching. Today's word comes as a prophetic word of encouragement. God is leaving blessings behind. But might I encourage you to please rehearse the previous seven sessions of my teachings. Don't just isolate this prophetic impression and trust God for it without fulfilling all of the criteria and all of the principles that I have enunciated in the past few weeks. If you continue in Joel chapter 2 in verse 18, God says, The Lord will be zealous for His land, and He will have pity on His people. The Lord will answer and say to His people, Behold, I am going to send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied in full with them. And I will never again make you a reproach or an embarrassment or shamed among the nations. In verse 21 he says, Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Again in verse 22, do not fear. In the midst of the crisis, do not fear, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. For the tree has borne its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine have yielded in full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for He has given you the early rain for your vindication, and He has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain, as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. Verse 25, And I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. Notice the emphasis, my manifest presence. I am in the midst of Israel. And I am the Lord your God. Might I just stop here and remind you of this. God says, I'm going to do this restorative work for you economically. And what I do will testify to my presence. God will say, I'm doing that just to show you I am in the midst of you. So I really want to strongly encourage us to again refocus on the Holy Spirit. And to host His presence, not just in our bodies. Your body is the temple of the Lord. In your homes, in your cars, at your work uh, places. Be aware of the manifestation, the tangible, the observable, the discernible presence of the Holy Ghost. Wherever God manifests His presence, environments are altered. States are changed. And I am speaking this word prophetically. I want to say this to all of us. Expect your landscape to change visibly before your eyes. God's going to transform external environments simply to demonstrate to you how to value His presence. I am in the midst of you. Might I charge the church, do nothing to make the Holy Ghost feel uncomfortable in your lounge, your bedroom, your TV room, your place of leisure, your place of work. Wherever you go, may God look at you and find you the ideal magnet that attracts His manifest presence within your world. I am not speaking abstractly. I'm not speaking pie in the sky here. This is a very real biblical thing that can take place. Might I prophesy to you, I see external transformation taking place. I see external environments being transformed by the power of the Lord. Verse 27 again, Thus you will know I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. It will come about after this. After what? 
after the repentance, after the three calls he made prior to this for the nation to repent. I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind, etc. So the outpouring of the spirit based upon the repentful turning towards the Lord is going to be accompanied by significant economic restoration. You would agree with me that the way the world is going, we have to have heavenly economic aid in the current environment. Your job is not even safe anymore. Your level of income that you are so accustomed to all these years is not guaranteed anymore. What we have to rely is on is heavenly economic aid. And God, in the context of gross darkness covering the earth, promised that light will arise on his people. And God in this season, I believe, will take great care of us, his sons. In the book of Joel, continuing chapter 3, verse 1, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Notice, there's a promise of economic restoration, the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. In Joel 3, 18, And in that day the mountain will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. What I want you to notice here in chapter 2 and verse 23, the text says, So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for He has given you the early rain for your vindication, and He has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. So the outpouring of the Holy Ghost is symbolized by the outpouring of rain. Now, geographically, naturally, in Israel, they know two rainy seasons that are rainy seasons of note. You have the early rains in the months of October stroke November, which is called the former rains, the early or the former rains. And this is in the, of, this is in the autumn months. And then you have the later rains, which is called the latter rain or the spring rains, usually in the months of March or April. So if you read the text again, God says, I'm going to pour you out the early rain for your vindication and I will pour down for you the rain. Notice the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. So obviously, Israel was an agricultural community. They were farmers. For them, rain means economic restoration. Because rain waters their crops that grow and produce. So the promise of the Holy Spirit also has a tendon with it. Built into this dynamic is economic ascendancy, economic buoyancy, economic restoration. And I want you to hold this thought within your heart. But before we get into the crux of the issues here, the Hebrew word for former rain is the word more. And it literally means a teacher of righteousness. It literally means a teacher of righteousness. So God is saying a couple of things here. God is saying, I am going to give you the early rains, the former rains, the first rains, the autumn rains, November, December. I will also give you the later rains, the spring rains, March, April. But these two together will be called the rain. Notice the text on your screen again, Joel 2.23. The last part, he has poured down for you the rain, singular, the early and the latter rain as B4. Now, the promise here is economic restoration. Now, the word more means a teacher of righteousness. So, you can't have the later without having the former. You can't have the latter without the, the first. And God says, what takes place first will produce what must come later. Although He, he also said, I'll give you both in the same month, which I will explain in a moment. But if the word former, if first comes before latter, 
and first means a teacher of righteousness. God is really saying for us to experience the fullness, which is both reigns in one season, that as a foundation, we have to be taught righteousness. We have to subscribe to righteous living. Now, you, if you study this imagery of latter rain and former rain throughout the Old Testament, you will definitely come to this conclusion. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11, it says, It will come about, in verse 13, It will come about if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and your soul, and that He will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early and the late rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil, and He will give grass in your fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. You will eat and be satisfied. So the promise here to Israel, if you obey my word, the rains are automatic. What activates the rain is obedience to the word of God. The rain of God's spirit, his grace and his anointing is activated, ignited by an obedient lifestyle to God's word. Might I just mention here, the imagery of rain in the Bible refers to two things predominantly. It refers to the Holy Spirit and it also refers to the word of God. And I keep saying that these two are indissolubly one. The Spirit does work with God's Word. The Son that is obedient to the Word of God gets the Holy Spirit's pouring out over Him. Acts 5.32b, God has given the Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. If you want the rainy season in your life, activate the obedient life. If you want the rainy season, activate obedience. Obedience is the catalyst that causes the heavens to break and rain to fall upon your existence. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 1 and 2, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, and my speech distill as the dew, and as the droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herb. Note again here, yeah, the Bible is very clear that God's teaching, if you look at you on your screen, let my teaching drop like rain. So you cannot expect the rain of the Holy Spirit until you subscribe to the rain of the teaching of righteousness from God's word. I want to remind you here, the Hebrew word, for the first or the former reigns is more rare, which literally implies a teacher of righteousness or teaching of righteousness. And we've been laboring in this series that we need to put principles in place in our lives. Like, for example, I taught you fasting helps us to overcome three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life so that we could give expression to the fact that indeed we are the sons of God and the Spirit anoints the Son who has overcome in the wilderness. Now, when we receive this grace, when based upon an obedient lifestyle, a rainy season is activated within our lives. It will come with tremendous favor. So the favor of God, which is the grace of God, poured out over your life in the Bible is often also depicted by rain. Proverbs 16 verse 15, In the light of a king's face is life. In the light of a king's face is life. And his favor or grace is like a cloud with spring rain. In other words, a cloud with the latter rain. A cloud with the spring rain. 
that presupposes the former rain. When farmers plowed their fields and cast their seed, they waited for the first rains. They waited for those autumn rains. And then they would wait for the latter rain to grow and develop the crop to full harvest. So the first rains were often associated with the planting of seed and the latter rains were often associated with the harvesting of crops. Okay, so you can't plant crops until you've planted seed and seed sowing was often associated with the first rains. First rains, former rains, more rare, teaching or teachers of righteousness implies that we have to cast the right seeds in our lives of righteousness in order to reap the harvests associated with the spring or the latter rains. In the book of Joel 2 verse 24b, it says, And he will cause the rain to come down for you. I'm quoting the New King James here. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now this is phenomenal. God is not just saying that you need to observe two seasons separate and distinct from each other. Former and latter rain. Seed sowing and harvest. The observance of seeds of righteous lifestyles and entering into the result thereof. God is not just saying that these two will be separate, the one activating and igniting the other. God is saying here, I will give you both these experiences in the same month. Look at the text again on your screen. In fact, in the NASB, it doesn't say the first month. But if you look at the original Hebrew, it does imply it. So the New King James Version is absolutely correct in its framing of this verse. It says the following again, He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. So it's not two separate months with two separate rains. God says, in my restorative work, it's almost like you will not have to wait. In natural Israel, you will have to sow seed in October, November and reap the crop the following year in March, April. And you'll have to wait for two distinct rainy seasons, peculiar rain distinct to each season. But God is saying now, in terms of my restorative work, both rains same month, both rains simultaneously, both activities of seed sowing and harvest simultaneously all in the same epoch of time. Now church, this is a prophetic word. This is not a teaching. This is a prophetic impulse that I'm, that I, that I'm feeling burdened for within my heart. I believe God is saying to us, if you get your act together, you can observe seed sowing and harvest in the same period of time. This speaks to acceleration. This speaks to heightened momentum. And there are various scriptures in the Bible that depict this. Because of time, let me just reference one. Amos 9.13 Behold the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, he who sows seed. And the mountains will drip with new wine. So God is saying, if you look at the text again on your screen, the plowman who plows up the soil, prepares it for seed sowing, that guy is going to overtake the guy who is reaping the harvest. And the treader of grapes, who is a harvester of the vine, tramples the grapes to produce grape juice and wine, that guy is going to overtake the one who is sowing the seed. So what you're going to have is activities of seed sowing and harvest simultaneous. The word overtake in the Hebrew literally means to run up towards and to touch. To run up towards and to touch. So the plowman will run up towards um, the reaper and touch him and say, hey guy, I'm here. So the treader of grapes runs up towards the guy sowing seed, touches him touches and gives him notification. Hey, I'm here. It's like two distinct activities from two workmen in a field that should be on the field 
at differing times by virtue of the requirements of the land are now touching each other, busy working side by side because we don't know whether it's harvest time or whether it's seed time, but both activities are absolutely conducive to being functioning simultaneously all in the same month. Now, this is the impression that I get for our house, and I believe for anybody watching and has been following this series, God is saying, I'm going to restore you in many ways, and I will restore you economically as well. And my restoration will depend upon your activity of obedience to my word. Obey the reign of my word and you will receive a reign of outpouring of my spirit. This outpouring promised in the book of Joel will be intense. It will be compounded. It's not just one kind of rain. It's the early rain and the latter rain all in the same month activities of sowing and reaping happening simultaneously now here is the challenge that i want to present to us and it's found in the book of zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. it says ask rain from the lord at the time of the spring rain spring rain is the last rain the latter rain the Lord will make the storm clouds and he will give them showers of rain, vegetation in the field to each man, vegetation in the field to each man. Recently, we received a prophetic word from Sean Blicknote, which is a noted and regarded prophet within our ranks and beyond that in the South African economy, there will be a resurgence of the mining sector and the mining industry. And while in our recent past, there's been the looting of businesses and an attempt to cripple business, that prophecy said that God is going to, and I quote, visit us from house to house, house to house and bless each house with a renewed anointing for entrepreneurial engagement or business engagement. Now, this morning's broadcast is a deviation from my normal teaching. So I felt while we've been stressing these things on our Saturday morning prayer meetings, which I, I want all of you to start attending, make the sacrifice and come because God is doing something phenomenal. And we've been emphasizing some of these things at that platform. I felt the Lord saying, release it now on a Sunday morning so that it has credible witness. Release it now on a Sunday morning, not just to inform your people, but now to activate something in the realm of the Spirit. At the beginning of July, I felt the impulse of the Lord, born out of one of those Saturday morning prayer meetings, that the next three months, that is July, August, and September, will be significant months of seeking the Lord diligently, of turning our hearts from our wicked ways to the Lord and really just plugging in and trusting God for a greater outpouring and growing into the fullness of the measure of the outpouring of the Spirit. I want to say this very, very clearly to us. We are about in the middle of that process now, just under the middle of that process. And I want to encourage the church to be very focused now is not the time to be disoriented away from my directive, which is not mine. It's the Lord's directive for us. Uh, we're all busy, but I want to encourage you. One thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good part that will not be taken away from her. One thing is absolutely vital in the season is that you give your attention, your devotion, and all your obedience to the Lord in these times. And I believe that the latter and the former rain is going to be poured on us in the same month. But if you look at the text on your screen again, it says the following, to ask for the rain at the time of the spring rain. And so in our prayer meetings on a Saturday morning and every uh, Wednesday, every fortnight Wednesday, we've been asking the Lord, send us the rain. We're going to ask for rain at the time of the rain. You've got to ask for things in the season that God has designed to release them. 
And we're discerning, God, it's the time, it's the season for this. So I really want to inspire and encourage us all to literally ask for the rain in the season of this spring rain. And it's not just a spring rain. It's the former and the, the latter, the spring rains, together in the same month. One particular verse that we focused on at Saturday morning prayer meetings was Isaiah 32 verse 15. And it says the following, Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered a forest. Yet we have very clear biblical basis for an external natural physical environment being transformed by the outpouring of the spirit it's a threefold restorative process and god is saying that what is a wilderness what is a wasteland will become a fertile field and the fertile field is considered a forest so god is after the forest dimension and the forest dimension speaks of fullness imagine a full forest in fact, I have a poster, if you look at it on your screen, you will see this transformation at the top from this arid, dry, non-bearing, no growth, no products, nothing growing, wasteland, desert, arid-like, wilderness condition, and then suddenly things transformed. Now, I like to imagine things. If you look at that screen, the forest speaks of lush growth, speaks of fullness, speaks of satiety, speaks of... Uh, development. Um, there's a host of provisions that are attendant with the idea of forest. And God is after the forest dimension in your life. But nothing happens until the Spirit is poured out. And I feel very, very strongly, the more we focus on the outpouring of the Spirit's dimension upon our lives in the current season, that external environments must transform. And if you analyze the text carefully, it says this wilderness will be transformed or becomes into a fertile field. Nothing is growing on the field yet. The field is just transformed to fertility. But the text says the fertile field is considered a forest. It's not a forest yet. From God's perspective, it is considered a forest. The fertile field has forest bearing capacity, forest potential. And I say to all of you that might be listening to me today, the Holy Spirit wants to be made manifest in your life, in your body, in your temple, in your heart, your soul, your mind, your spirit. He wants to manifest His power overtly in terms of a manifest tangible presence within your life, within your home, such that your external, even your external environment will know change. And here I'm speaking specifically to your economic state. God's going to take care of you economically. Might I just, as an aside, ask you to really host the presence of the Lord in your homes. In, in your dwelling places, there where you live. When people come to your home, may they note something distinct about your dwelling, about your house, that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Where the manifest presence of God is, there is the promise of economic ascendancy and economic buoyancy. And I want to encourage you to trust God for this within your lives. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So there was a time when the earth existed in water. And this is part of the creation design of God. And the Bible says that darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit moved or hovered over the 
waters. The reference to deep here doesn't refer to oceans, because oceans were only made much later. And the reference to darkness here doesn't refer to night, because sun, moon and stars were only made on day four. The reference to deep here refers to the Father, right? The Father. The reference here to waters refers to the Son. And the reference to the Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit. So if you look at the text on your screen again, it says that darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Darkness was over the face of the deep, the Father. And darkness here means ignorance, something hidden, not disclosed. That's why the first act of creation is let there be light, not sunlight, because sun was only made on day four. Light was the self-revelation and disclosure coming out of hiddenness of God. So, the deep here refers to the Father. And you know verses like deep cries unto deep. And it says that the Spirit of the Lord was moving over the surface of the water. Water is an imagery of the Word of God, a reference to the Son of God, who is the Word of God. But then it says that the earth was formless and void. Right? Formless and void. So, so long as the earth is formless and void, the Father, the Godhead, cannot be revealed. The Hebrew word for formless is the word tohu, which is chaos, confusion, disorder, barrenness, and a wasteland kind of wilderness. And the Hebrew word for void is bohu, which is emptiness. Right? So, the word bohu, emptiness, or void, speaks to an absence also of purpose or intent. So, there was a time when the earth was formless, chaotic, and in confusion. It was a wasteland. It was arid. It was barren. It was formless and empty. Right? It was tohu and bohu. Whenever you have tohu, you have bohu. Wherever something is not formed, you have an emptiness. It's vacuous. It is without purpose. And in this economy, obviously, God begins to speak and the Spirit moves over the surface of the water. Uh, the New Testament says all things were created by Christ and in Him all things consist. In Him all things consist, Him being the water or the Word from which God would then make everything. And so suddenly you have purpose, you have form, you have shape, you have definition. What was formless becomes formed chaos and the confusion and the disorder is banished and God's purposes now when man is ultimately created on day six the purposes of the Lord can be hosted and the unseen God the invisible God can now be seen in creation there is an interesting verse in Genesis 2 verse 5 which says now no shrub of the field was yet present in the earth now there was no growth no productivity. No plant of the field had yet sprouted. Why? For the Lord God had not sent rain. No rain on the earth. And remember we said rain is depictive of the word and the spirit. And there was no man to cultivate the ground. Here's the principle. God doesn't send rain until he has a man. God says in Genesis 2.5 that even after everything was created, there was no rain yet. Because God could not find a man on the earth to cultivate the ground. So rain falls because a man is prepared to work or to cultivate the soil. Now in Job's CV, in Job's listing of his various good qualities in Job chapter 29, he said this in verse 23, They waited for me as for the rain. And they opened their mouth as for the spring rain. In the King James Version, they waited for me as for the rain. They opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. 
They long for me, the NLT says, to speak as people long for rain. They drank my words like a refreshing spring rain. Now I want to encourage you with this. There's no rain because there's no man. Job's conviction is people long to hear him as one that brings rain. More than you anticipating that God now is going to rain on your life in a profound measure. You then too must become the embodiment of that rain dynamic even to other people within your world. Job is saying, I don't just have the rain. I've become the rain even to, to others within my world. I've become the rain to others within my world. And might I encourage you, this rain dynamic is going to grow with such profundity. The observable, manifest presence of the Lord is going to be a significant reason why you and I prosper within this time. I have many other scriptures here, but time will not permit me um, to go through all of them. I just want to say one thing here. In the promise in the book of Joel, God promises that what every category of locust has consumed, God has promised restoration. In Joel 2.25, God says, I will make up to you for the years. So there's the restoration of lost time and the restoration of lost opportunities. Read the text again. God says, I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust the stripping locust, and the knowing locust, my great army which I sent among you. The Holman version of the Bible says, I will repay you for the years. And the NLT says, I will give you back what you have lost. I will give you back what you have lost. There are many scriptures in the Bible that relate a person's prosperity to the manifest presence of God. For example, Joseph in Genesis 39, 2 says, The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. Concerning Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18, 7, The Lord was with him and he prospered wherever he went. Concerning David in 2 Samuel 5, 10, David went on and became great and the Lord of hosts was with him. Obadidim in 2 Samuel 6, The ark remained. In the house of Obadidim, the Gittite, and the Lord blessed Obadidim and all his house. And again, I want to remind you with this specific promise. Joel 2.27 Then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. I just feel that going forward, all of us need to be very keenly aware that God is not just omnipresent. He doesn't just indwell me. He wants to manifest himself in my world. And there are many principles governing the manifest presence of God. All I want to encourage you here, this is going to be a significant reason for our ongoing prosperity. You see, we prosper because God is with us. Never do anything to abort to sabotage or to cause God's presence to lift off. When God's presence lifts, then the restoration of environments lift. I am trusting God that God gives us the early and the latter rain symbolically, that the activities of sowing and reaping, the gap between them will be reduced to negligibility. You can't distinguish are we in reaping time or sowing time because both activities are happening simultaneously. God is into restorative mode. Any wilderness is going to become a fertile field and the fertile field is going to become a forest in the name of Jesus. Formlessness and voidness is a thing of the past. God now is going to fill our lives with tremendous purpose. He's going to send rain because he has found a man. He's going to send rain because he has found a man like Job who also becomes rain to his 
environment. So would you lift your hands in prayer with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. And I pray, O oh God, that you would grant to us the early and the latter rain in a single month. We are waiting upon you for these months, ardently seeking you for greater outpourings and revelations of your Spirit's presence in and around us, in our environments, in our workplaces, our homes, our families, our churches. Come and presence yourself. Make our home your home. Make our hearts your home. For where your presence is, your prosperity is too, Father. And I ask you that the former rain will teach us righteousness, and the latter rain will bring the harvest, both processes happening simultaneously. I just thank you for the prophetic word that entrepreneurial and business anointing will visit from house to house by your hand and your determination. In Jesus' name, I just thank you for this. I lift up my hands to you now and I ask you to fill every home with your presence. Fill every home with the manifest dimension of your Spirit's outpouring. For those that have not been filled, may they be filled now to overflowing with the power and the person of the precious Holy Spirit in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Before we go, we're going to celebrate communion. And every time we do this sacrament, we access grace. This sacrament is not routine. This is grace transactional. We receive grace every time we do this. And I want you to do it soberly, seriously, and thoughtfully. We remember the Lord Jesus. We remember the basis, the foundations of our salvation. We also take cognizance of the body of Christ to which we are called, that we must discern it accurately so we don't die premature, prematurely or become sick unnecessarily. But as you lift up your emblems before the Lord, the Bible says He died. And it says in the book of Romans, the same Spirit that raised Him from the dead dwelt in us. That Spirit of life, that Spirit that transforms bodies, minds, and even external environments. As we celebrate communion today, I want to celebrate immunity over your economic well-being. Because the cross, salvation, is all-encompassing. It doesn't just affect us in spirit or in soul, but even in reference to our bodies. So would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for taking care of all of us. By faith, I thank you that your people will not be put to shame again. I thank you for the reign of heaven. Thank you for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the cross paved the way for that. And I ask as we remember your body and celebrate your blood too, that your grace will be poured out to each family, that you indeed would grant us preservation from the ravaging effects of your locust army sent in all the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. For the local house, we meet on Wednesday at our house church gatherings where we will unpack this message further. In the notes that you will receive, there's also a host of other examples of this principle that I would like you to study and to discuss at house church level as well. So it's raining. Tell someone it's raining. Okay. The latter and the former rain together in the same month. The rain of the Lord, the manifest presence of the Lord that's going to transform external economic states is what God is stressing. I want to remind you, Zechariah 10, ask for rain. In the time of the spring rain, this harvest time, we need to consistently pray for. So be in a prayerful, fasted spirit this entire week as well. 
Lift your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you. And may the Lord give you His peace. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. Extend the borders of my heart I'm longing to receive more of Your glorious anointing power Let Your Spirit flow right now Fill me with Your holy fire Burn away Your wrong desire Let Your glory grow in me Touch the nations now Faithful Lord.